Uh, Mr. Technical, on behalf of the government, do you wish to make an opening? Yes, Sean. Okay. You Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. People v. Mark Anthony Torrey Jr. This case is about drunken drinking, drunken anger, drunken shooting, and the drunken killing of Albert Piola, who was a police officer at that time. By a fellow police officer, the defendant, Mark Anthony Torrey Jr. The evidence will show the following. July 12, 2015, it was a Sunday. Officer Piolo, like many families, takes his out to breakfast. His wife, Mika, his four children, ages ranging from eight months to 14 years old, to Josie's Bat Choy restaurant in Dededo. And then from there, they go to Guam Hardwood, Hardwood Hardware Store so they can get some parts because like many fathers, he has to fix things at home. That day he had to fix the plumbing, the toilet. Around noon, Mika takes the three oldest children to go to a baby shopper down in Tumon. Bert Piolo stays at home to watch the baby and to fix the plumbing, as well as to also think about preparing for his band later that night. Even though Bert was not a large man, only standing five foot four, about 155 pounds. He lived a large and busy life. He was a trained police officer. He had been trained in SWAT. And in July of 2015, he was working at the GPD Executive Security for the governor and lieutenant governor. Bert was active in, with a social civic fraternity, Domino Lux sponsored sporting events like boxing and he was trying to supplement his income as a Guam police officer by starting his own business starting a, a, a line a product line of clothes based on the logo Guam Vibes V-I-B-E-Z or Good Vibes logos selling out of his truck and that small outlet in Dededo and you're going to learn from the evidence that one of his other favorite things to do in his busy life was to play for a band, his band, play drums, play combos, called Soul Vibes for the past year, back in 2015, at the beach bar on Sundays from between 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And you will learn that he was an outgoing fellow who would always talk to the crowd in between and invite many friends, including the police officers, to come down and listen to the uh, Soul Vibe <coughs> at the beach bar. When Mika came home with the kids from the baby shower, Bert was preparing to leave for his uh, play music gig at the beach bar around five or so. He kisses his wife goodbye, his baby. 5 p.m. that July 12, 2015. That's the last time that his wife and family would see him. And less than 10, later, 10 hours later, between 2 and 3 a.m., Bert would die of a painful death at the hands of this man, the defendant, who committed reckless murder on July 13, 2015, by recklessly causing the death 
of Albert Piola, under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life. With this factual allegation of possessing and using a firearm in the commission of that reckless murder. The defendant is also charged with committing manslaughter on or about July 13, 2015, by recklessly causing the death of Albert Piolo with a special allegation of possessing and using a deadly weapon, his gun, in the commission of that felony manslaughter. And he's also charged with two counts of aggravated assault which both also have the deadly weapon special allegation of use and possession of a deadly firearm in the commission of those felonies, aggravated assault in the second degree and in the third degree. Now the evidence is going to show that same day, July 12, 2015. The defendant, you will learn, is a police officer, SWAT trained police officer. In fact, he was just, had been featured in the popular media a couple months before as a father-son tribute to him and his father, Lieutenant Mark Torrey Sr., who completed SWAT training together. You will also learn that he's also a trained military person who served in the Army, was an officer in the Army, had been deployed, and was serving in the guard, and was on guard duty that weekend, and came home that Sunday around noon, and you will learn that uh, he had some beers at home, and he drank while watching the ultimate uh, fighting championships or fights. And meanwhile, during that day, his wife, Mrs. Julia Torrey, was out with her friends, and at some point in the afternoon, she goes to the beach bar with her friends, but not with her husband. He's still at home and was at guard duty. And we will learn from the evidence later that Mrs. Julia Torrey, the defendant's wife, eventually leaves the beach bar, goes home, and then later that night, about 10 p.m., July 12, 2015, the defendant, Mark Torrey Jr., decides that he's going to go down to the beach bar uh, to either listen to the band or to drink with his fellow officers. Because the place you'll learn from others is known as a a frequent place to socialize on Sunday, to listen to the band, because one of the band members is a police officer, Officer Bert Piolo. <coughs> you will learn from the evidence that Officer Bert Piolo, together with the defendant, have been observed drinking together, drinking with other people, drinking alcohol, taking shots, having a good time, talking with other officers, talking with other women patrons, and having a good time. The band stops playing around 10 p.m., but they continue to drink and socialize there at the beach bar until around midnight, you'll learn at that, also from the evidence, that Bert is texting friends, including women friends. Uh, he sends one, a text to a woman friend, about around midnight, into July 13th, letting her know that they're, they're going out after, they're planning or talking about going out afterwards, and some of the other, pay, uh, other uh, employees and other officers that they were talking about going to an establishment, cheers, or abandoned ship, two other bars after the beach bar. In fact, you will learn from uh, Mrs. P. 
Piolo, Mika Piolo, the wife of Officer Bert Piolo, that she contacts him. They speak on the phone sometime between 12.30 and 12.40 a.m. She's wondering whether he's going to come home. What time is he going to come home? He lets her know that he's planning to come home right afterwards because he's packing up. And a fellow officer, Jimmy, Officer Jimmy Rossetti, is handed the phone by Bert to talk to Mika to let her know the same thing. And that's the last time. Not that she sees him. The evidence will show that's the last time that she speaks to him on the phone. <coughs> and then we will learn that the defendant who drove his wife's car there, a black Toyota Yaris, and you'll learn that Bert drives a red Toyota Tacoma truck. They drove their vehicles, their cars, to a abandoned ship. And this is after midnight. They decide not to head out to Cheers. They and some other officers, they, Bert Piolo, and the defendant, they go to a abandoned ship, which is a bar down in Tumon. <coughs> You'll find out that it's part of the Pacific Arcade, right next to the, on the slingshot side. Some of you might know that there are uh, other establishments there. Uh, you might learn that Porky, Porky, <coughs> Porky's, Vikings upstairs. And they go there to continue to drink some more at the social at that abandoned ship. And the abandoned ship is a small, very small bar with an outside deck also. <coughs> and the abandoned ship that Sunday is significant for abandoned ship because there, that was the summer and they were hosting events on Sundays where they had multiple bands play to draw people in. <coughs> And among the evidence, besides testimony, we will show you a small video, or attempt to show you a small video clip of the defendant and the victim, Bert Piolo, while they were inside the abandoned ship. And you heard testimony that they had also been drinking inside there. Hear testimony from at least four people, if not five, who were at the garden <coughs> ship when Bert Piolo, some other officers, and the defendant, Mark Troy Jr., were there. And what stood out for them that early morning hours of July 13, July 13, 2015. They observed that the two men were intoxicated, but that the defendant, Mark Torrey, was more intoxicated. You will learn from them that he was belligerent, angry, or arrogant. One of the bouncers, Charles Pendleton, he served in the guard under the defendant, Mark Torrey Jr. So he recognized him when he came in. And like, and what the bouncers will tell you, the security men, and those two are Charles Pendleton and Kevin Jackson. Part of their job is to look out for people who are too intoxicated, or who may need assistance, or who may need to be calmed down in the event they become too angry, belligerent, or violate any other rules concerning drinking of alcohol. Charles Pendleton, the bouncer, the security man, he alerts his fellow bouncer, Kevin Jackson, essentially telling him to be prepared. My LT, and what he's referencing there, is the defendant whom he served under, because the defendant was at that time a 
lieutenant in the Army Guard. Charles Pendleton tells his fellow security guard or bouncer, Kevin Jackson, be prepared. My LT is there. Words to the effect, acting like an asshole and dickhead. <clears throat> you will also hear testimony from the owner, Tony Cruz, that when the defendant <coughs> was outside on the deck, that he proceeded to look at him up and down in a challenging manner, similar to what people locally refer to as Atambaba, like you wanted to challenge him or, or to size him up. <coughs> and of course, the bouncers observed this. They're alerted. Another patron, a person that happened to be there, is a well-known TV personality and broadcaster, Crystal Popo. She was there at abandoned ship that night and that early morning. And she will testify and tell you that she had observed the defendant and believed that he was intoxicated. He appeared to be intoxicated and that he was, if not belligerent, arrogant. Because on his way walking out of the bar to the outside deck, he says words to the effect of, you think you're hot shit. It doesn't end there. Because the defendant, at some point that night, he tries to leave when he's on the outside of the deck with a drink, walk outside the deck into the road with a drink, which is not allowed. And the bouncers, Charles Pendleton, will tell you that he had to try to stop the defendant from taking the drink out because it's against the rules. And you will learn that the defendant said words to the effect of, do you want me to slap your fucking face, fucking face? Or how about I slap your fucking face? Meanwhile, Officer Bert Piolo, you will learn, is trying to call the defendant down if he knows that he's too intoxicated because he has to calm him down. And so he get, tries to get him to leave. And then they proceed to attempt to leave. You will learn, too, that they were, Bert was trying to help the defendant find his car. And he couldn't, they couldn't locate it. In fact, Bert texts one of his fellow officers, who knew the defendant very well, Officer Sean Mendel. In fact, Officer Sean Mendel will tell you that he was in the guard at that time, and he was the commander of the company that the defendant served in at that time. The defendant was his executive officer. <coughs> and Bert asked him, because Sean Mendel, Officer Sean Mendel, and Bert served together at executive security. He texted him, you know, what kind of car does Bert have? I mean, what kind of car does Mark, Marky have? Referring to the defendant. Of course, Mr. Mendel, this is at one something in the morning, doesn't respond. You will see some video footage showing the defendant and the victim, Bert Piolo, attempting to leave. And at some point, they do eventually leave around 1.40, 1.41 a.m. in the morning from a abandoned ship in Bert's truck, a red Toyota Tacoma. Now, back 
backing up a little bit, the evidence will also show that about 12, 29 a.m. that morning, July 13th, Bert sends a text to Ms. Leia Puong, a fellow employee. She was like a chief of staff or administrative officer for the lieutenant governor's staff and handles the schedule and coordinates the executive security when they should pick up the governor or the lieutenant governor. And about 12.29, Bert texts to her to say, I'm drunk, so what? And then she responds back, so what else is new? What's significant on this evidence that you'll receive is you'll also learn from Leia Uong that at about 1.54 a.m., and the evidence shows that Bert and the defendant left the abandoned ship about 1.40 a.m. That Bert sends a Snapchat picture of him and the defendant to Leia Puong at 1.54 a.m. that morning. <coughs> at 2.15 a.m morning of July 13, 2015, 911 gets a call. 911 gets a call from Officer Bert Piola calling for help. calls for help to 911. You will learn that no one else calls 911. That's the emergency medical dispatch on fire. 911 operators know that he's been shot. He starts that call at 2.15 in the morning. You will also get evidence that the call logs of the defendant indicate at 2.14 a.m. he was calling his wife's phone number. And that he's eventually, about 2.21 a.m., leaves a voice message on his wife's number that states, honey, I'm done, we're done. I don't even know how it happened. Meanwhile, or before that, Officer Piola, whom you will hear on the 911 call eventually, is moaning and is in the throes of dying, calling for help, gives the wrong address, to the 911 operator. Tells him, Chalan and NCI, you'll learn that that's a location over in Dedido, near the much, closer to the Machinal area, where actually you'll learn from Mika that Bert and his wife and kids lived in that area at that time. But he tells the operators, Chalan and NCI, the wrong address. So the medics and the northern, uh, the the little precinct officers, they all respond because they get the call. Gun, uh, officer injured, gunshots, and they learn it's officer, and all they have that information is Officer Piola and Officer Mark Torrey. And you'll learn from Officers Barry Flores and Officer Edwards that, that early morning hours, they go to the wrong address until eventually they're turned around to go up to Chico, the correct address. That happens because 
Bert is able to somehow get the attention of the defendant's father, Lieutenant Mark Torrey Sr. What you're going to find out from the evidence here is that Bert drove the defendant to his house. His house is a three-story structure where the defendant and his wife lives on the second floor, his grandmother on the first floor, and his parents, Deanne and Mark Torrey Sr., the lieutenant, live on the third floor. Bert drives him home to the defendant's, drives the defendant to his home. Bert is shot at the defendant's home in his vehicle, just out on the road, just outside the car park. The evidence will show that the defendant's firearm was found in Bert's truck on the driver's side, the dashboard. The evidence will show that Bert did not have a gun. The evidence will show that in the passenger seat, there's an unexpended cartridge or bullet. You'll learn that the firearm that belongs to officer, then officer Tory, was a Glock 27. That the magazine carries 40 caliber. That the magazine carries up to nine bullets. One unexpended bullet is found in the passenger seat. We'll learn from Officer Taekwenko, the firearms expert, that bullets, unexpended bullets, can be ejected. The only way they can be ejected from the firearm that is unexpended, meaning it hasn't been fired, is that by loading that pistol, by moving the slide back to load it which would cause the unexpended shell to eject at the same time, causing any other bullets or cartridges to move, one to move up into the chamber to be ready to fire by pulling the trigger. The evidence will also show that in Bert's truck, there's blood all over the driver's side. Vomit is on the driver's side seat. And in between the console and the driver's seat is a folded sunshade, a sunscreen that people used to for their windshield. And on top of that sunscreen, the police see an expended shell. And you'll learn from Officer Taekwenko that there were seven unexpected ones still in the magazine. One expended shell in the passenger seat, unexpended shell in the passenger seat, and an expanded one on the side of the screen in between the console and the driver's seat. Piolo was on the phone, the 911 operator. His longest call was about 15 minutes. <coughs> for, or the total time for all the calls was about 15 minutes. But during that one particular long period, while he's calling for help, and the operator's trying to talk, talk to him and calm him down, Asking, is there anybody else there? And Bert had told her, yes, there's another officer there. She had asked about Officer Mark Tory. You will learn that she keeps trying to get Officer Mark Tory on the, on the phone. And 
and she does. Yeah, I'll show my toy on the phone. And you will listen to that 911 call. And you, the others will show that Officer Tory did not give the correct address location, even when asked by the operator who asked whether is this residence Bert's home? No response. When asked questions about how did it happen, was it accidental shooting? He responded with answers that were not responsive. Eventually, the evidence will show you on the 911 call. Lieutenant Mark Torrey gets on the phone, gets on Bert's phone, and talks to the operator and gives the correct address so that now the ambulance, the medics, the Guam Police Department officers were all concerned. Especially because the call is about Bert Piolo, the defendant, Mike Torrey Jr. And this is Dedito Precinct, whose commander at that time was the defendant's father, Lieutenant Mark Torrey Sr. Indeed, you're going to find out that the senior officer who showed up at the crime scene was Officer Barry Flores, the uncle of the defendant. And you will learn that. When the officers arrived there, they were trying to assess what was going on together with Officer Ed, John Edwards, trying to understand what happened. But the evidence will show that the investigation revealed that the only gun that was recovered at the scene in the truck was the defendant's. Officer John Tequenko, the firearms expert, will be testifying that the casing, the expended casing found in the sunscreen matched the defendant's gun. The medics when they arrived medic 4, medic 10, the ambulance they come out and they see the defendant, as does Officer John Edwards, as does Officer Barry Flores. They're hugging the victim who's bleeding, who has no shirt. Apparently, to as a as a method or way to try to stop the bleeding on a on a gunshot hole in the chest. You'll learn it's on the right side the full line. And they all eventually put Bert on the gurney. You'll see that in the uh, audio, video, body camera <coughs> video that Officer John Edwards was wearing that morning when he responded to this call. Bert appears to be still conscious, but you'll learn from the medics that as they load him into the ambulance, they don't take off right away. They don't leave right away. And the advanced life-saving team, the other medics, they come because you'll learn that the medic for the first, the first group that responded, they only have basic life-saving training certification for PLS. So the ALS, the Advanced Life Saving Team, comes in. When the Advanced Life Saving Team comes in, into the back of the ambulance where Officer Bert Piolo has now lost consciousness. 
and the medics are beginning to try to do life-saving CPR. They bandage that wound, and the ALS medics go to work. You'll hear from AMT, Advanced Medic Tech, Alfred Scambalori. He and his partner went to work, started looking up the monitors, started preparing his uh, medication to try to get the heart started because when they hooked them up to the, uh, the vital signs, portable equipment that measures your heartbeat, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your oxygen, the numbers were going down rapidly. Meanwhile, they're trying to do CPR, they're using the uh, vent pump, the advanced AMT medic is trying to put intubate, put a, a uh, tube down bird's throat so he can get some oxygen into him. And they're there for about another additional 10 or 20 minutes. They don't roll out right away. And you'll learn that birds vital signs are no longer reading on the portable machines in the ambulance. And then they leave. Meanwhile, the body camera video will show that the defendant, Artori, being talked to and cared for. He's sitting on the back of his truck in his carport, being tended to, see that his wife can come up and give him a drink. Even at some point, the police, that he's not a suspect, he'll learn that Lieutenant Mark Torrey Sr. talked separately to the defendant, Mark Torrey Jr., because he asked the other officer to step away. And then you continue to ask him questions, and you'll get to watch his responses. And the defendant's in distress. You'll see that. Such that Officer Edwards is concerned and tries to call and calls for another medic to attend to the defendant who appears to now uh, have uh, breathing like he's breathing, having breathing difficulty. And the medics will come, another medic group, Engine 10, will come, and they'll proceed to examine the defendant. They will tell you they, they saw bloods, but they found no injuries, no scratches, no defense, wounds, no evidence of that sort. At some point, you'll see them, and the, uh, you'll hear from the testimony that they asked the defendant to lift his shirt. And one of the medics and the officers, they observed that the defendant had an empty holster inside the belt holster tucked in his pants. Defendants heard making statements on the body camera video. I never pointed it at him. He said they were not an item. That he tried to stop it. People are going to think I shot him. You will see evidence that. driver's side, to the tailgate side, to the driveway side of the fence house, along the wall of the carport. You'll learn from the emergency Medical dispatcher, 
that one of the responses from the defendant on the 911 tape recording is when asked what, what happened, he responds, he's feisty, he's feisty, ma'am. Bert finally gets the ambulance to come to the right direction when he gets the attention of the defendant's father and says to him, which is recorded on 911, LT, please help me. I'm dying, I'm dying. He shot me, he shot me. The evidence will show that prior to the medics getting there, prior to the police officers were arriving there, there were only three men at that location. The defendant's father, Lieutenant Mark Torrey Sr. Bert Piolo, and the defendant, Mark Torrey Jr. Dr. Espinola will testify did the autopsy on Officer Piolo. Then Officer Piolo died as a result of a gun contact. Contact, gunshot wound to the chest and into the abdomen. You will learn from him that the bullet, and you'll learn that those bullets were all 40 caliber hollow tip, copper tip hollow tips. That the bullet entered Officer Piolo's chest, hit the fifth rib, went through the diaphragm, tumbled through the diaphragm, ripped what the lobe of the of Bert's liver and eventually stopped in Bert's lower back lumbar area. And, all. and Dr. Espinola recovered <coughs> from the lower back side. And you will be able to observe that that bullet had mushroomed. Physical evidence, the gun, the bullets, the extended, the unextended. We'll also learn that traces of fiber were found on the barrel of Officer Piolo's pistol. That the FBI <coughs> conducted a gunshot residue test on Burke's shirt. We learn from the evidence that Burke had would appear to be like two holes in his shirt. You learn that he was wearing a tank top and a good vibes t-shirt. A shirt, by the way, that his wife had picked out for him that day and he asked her which one should I wear. He will play music at each bar. You learn from the FBI that it appeared that part of the shirt was folded, and so there was like a half moon rip into the into the first hole, which if you pull it apart would turn into a hole, a, a full circle hole, and then another hole. But the FBI analyzed that, and their conclusion was that there was gunshot residue in those entry, those holes, and it had to be less than two or three inches away. The last recorded word of Bert Piolo on the 911 recording at the emergency medical Dispatch 
that came from Bert that she heard in the background of the recording, the last word from Bert. Because he knew he was dying. He's telling them he's dying. He's declaring who shot him. His last word was, Mata. Death. Find the defendants, Mark Anthony Jr. Mark Anthony Torrey Jr. Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of reckless murder, manslaughter, aggravated assault in the second degree, aggravated assault in the third degree, all accompanied by special allegations of possession and use of a deadly weapon in the commission of those crimes. Thank you. Mr. Ariel, on behalf of the defense, you should make a note to this time. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. May it please the court, Mark Dory, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The government has just stated what they believe the evidence will show. But as in many, many cases, let's never forget, there's always two sides to every story. And this is one of those cases. Sunday, July 12, 2015. This was a drill weekend for Mark Dory. Mark had been on weekend drill since Sunday, Saturday morning until Sunday at about noon. Most of that day was spent watching the UFC fights and drinking beer and hanging out with a few family and friends all day. By about 10.30 that night, Mark went to meet up with some of his GPD cycle mates at the beach bar where he met up with one of them, Eddie Tiamson, and Bert Viola was playing in the band. Yes, the beach bar is a popular hangout, and Bert's band had been playing there for more than a year. For the next few hours, after a couple of hours after arriving at beach bar, witnesses say Mark and Bert were socializing, talking, and sharing drinks. They were all having a good time. Everyone was buying each other shots. All kinds of people were there. Terry Tenorio, the lieutenant governor's sister. Rose Calvo, the governor's daughter. Other people from the governor's office, or lieutenant governor's office, as well as several other cops. Everybody was having a good time and had described the alcohol intake of both Mark and Bird that night. Eddie Tiamzon will testify that he Mark and Bert decided to go to abandoned ship, a bar located across the street from the Hyatt. It's right there on the side of the street. You can see the little deck there. Video from that building, both in the interior, the bar, it's about this big, will be shown, as well as video from the exterior, the parking lot in the front, where Marky pulls in, and the parking lot in the back, where Mark and Bert are seen walking around, wandering around. And the video will show Mark, Bert, Eddie, and others, Crystal Falco, all drinking and having a good time, dancing, high-fiving. Bert, on the entry camera, can be seen walking in. He takes a big sway as he's walking in, so you can clearly see they're having a good time. Mark as well, dancing with the other guys, having a good time all appear quite intoxicated. There's no dispute about that. Several witnesses said Mark was extremely intoxicated and that Bert was also drunk. <coughs> One witness said Mark was so drunk, he, he drove Bert and Mark around from the back of the, the bar to the front to drop them off because they are kind of lost. And then he even turned around to make sure that they got away OK. Bert ended up driving Mark home. Mark's car was left behind. They left the abandoned ship at about 1.41 a.m., as it shows on the video. It takes about 21 minutes to drive from abandoned ship to the Tory residence up on Salon Andai in Jigo. Shortly after 2 a.m., a woman named Kathy Rizala 
is returning home to Jeep after dropping her husband at the airport to catch the 1.30 a.m. flight to Saipan. As she was driving on Thailand Handbag, a one-lane road where the Tory house is, she comes upon the Tory residence. She sees Bert's red truck parked on the road. <coughs> the driver's door is open. The rear lights are on. She has to move to the side of the road to pass. And as she's passing, she sees two men coming from the garage driveway area out towards the back of the truck. Either or both of them wave to her as if, OK, it's all OK, or sorry, we're walking the road, sorry. That's, that's her interpretation of how they wave to her as if to say hi or sorry we block blocking the road. <clears throat> she was very certain no one was in distress. No one is asking her to stop, pull over, help him. And it took no longer than 10 seconds for her to come upon the car and pass around and go around the block to her residence or her place where she was staying. She was interviewed a few times, even in Saipan, and gave her consistent statement that that's what she saw. She even provided a sketch. That's shortly after 2 a.m. At 2.15 a.m., the first 911 call comes in, and there's a hang-up. 2.16 a.m., the second 911 call comes in. It's about three minutes long. It's Bird, and he gives his house address several times to the 911 operator. Salani Rencia, Salani Rencia, Salani Rencia. Salani Rencia is about 10, 15 minutes away from Salan Andai in Jiba. Salan Urencia, as the government says, is about out in Nerido somewhere. <coughs> so all the cops from Nerido Precinct and all the medics are headed off to Salan Urencia. At 2.14 AM, right before the 911 call, Mark makes a call to his wife, shows on his cell phone numbers. He makes six calls during that time period, to 14 a.m. to about 2.21 a.m. During this time period, Bird is also on the phone talking to the 911 operators. After the first three-minute call from Bird at 2.16, there's a 2.20 call from Bert, and there's some markings as NA. Then again, at 2.20 AM, there's the long conversation with Bert. It lasts about 15 minutes. Lieutenant Tory, Mark's dad, eventually gets on the phone and says, we are here on Silent and I get out of here. Clears it all up, and finally, they're on their way. By 2.33 AM, both Guam police and Guam fire department medics arrive on the scene. <clears throat> Julia is receiving six calls from Mark while she's up sick, while she's in the house. She does not answer, but instead she calls upstairs to Dad and says, Dad, come down, something's wrong, something's up. Dad rushes down. Of course, nine, he appears on the 911 call recording, taking over from the, from Bert. The message Mark leaves at 2.18 a.m., last one minute message that he leaves on Julia's phone, says, Par, I'm done. We're done. We don't even know how this happened. A few minutes later, four cop cars arrive, seven cops, medics also arrive. The body cam 
will show most, but not all, most, but not all, of what occurs over the next 40 minutes as Officer Edwards pulls up, turns on his body cam, turns it on and off as he feels fit, and the body cam video will be shown to all of you. Last about 40 minutes long. It's interspersed with breaks. He takes a break and goes over and talks to Flores and talks to Kim Santos, the other captain. There's, there's different breaks in between. And Edwards decides when and where to turn it on and off to record and not to record. Please watch and listen carefully to the video and the audio of the body cam. It may be difficult to watch. Mark is seen at first holding on to Bert, trying to help him apply pressure to the wound here. Wound is here. Bert's not fighting with him. He's not saying, get that off of me. Leave me alone. He's not telling him to move away. Bird is eventually placed on a gurney by Mark, put into the ambulance. We see in the video it takes more than 10 minutes before they finally take off the GMH. According to the medics, Bird, Bert said nothing. Mark is then seated at the tailgate of his truck. He's questioned by Officer Edwards and Officer Flores. And you will see for yourself how very difficult it was for Mark at the time to answer any, any of their questions. For the most part, he's dazed and confused. He's shaking his head. Birdie pie, birdie pie. He's mumbling, and he's clearly incoherent. He really has no idea what just happened. But his responses are nonetheless very telling. Is it self-inflicted? He nods, yes. As if to say yes. Mark says, that's the way that I... Mark also says, I never pointed it. Mark says, he was unstable. Some kind of girlfriend. Pari, it fucking killed me. It tripped me out. I told him to stop and he just let loose. Some kind of girlfriend. Pari, killed me. It tripped me out. I told him to stop and he just let it loose. Mark is asked, was there a struggle? No. Not even. Did he point it at you? No. So he just stuck it to himself? Yes. Mark goes on later to say on his own, he wasn't even a threat. You weren't even a threat, Bird. A threat to who? He was asked, you said you got, he got into an argument with his girlfriend. Did they argue over the phone? He says, he claimed, he claimed, he claimed they weren't even an item. Mark is then asked, was there a verbal argument? No, not even. I didn't even argue with him. Listen here to Mark's statement that morning. Mark was taken by ambulance himself over an hour later to Navy Hospital. Mark said to the medics in the truck, and the medic from the ambulance kept saying this to him. I was trying to help a friend. I was trying to help a friend. He kept mumbling this, according to the medic. Mark arrives at Navy Hospital close to 4 a.m. The doctor reports that Mark said he's in shock. He did not know what happened. There's so much blood on me. Doctors found that he was okay, suffered no injuries, and he was released by about 5 a.m. His blood alcohol content was taken at 4 a.m. 
nearly two hours after the shooting and read a 0.26 BAC over three times the legal limit. Lieutenant Tory, his dad, and Mark went outside Navy Hospital and waited for investigators so that they can turn over all the Marquis clothes to the investigators. They did that, I believe, in the parking lot at Navy Hospital. They then went to the Guam Police Department. Mark was taken by his dad and his godfather, Jason Uggen, another officer in the Guam Police Department. And they waited all day at GPD in Tiza. They arrived there about 7 a.m. No one interviewed him at the time. No one sought to question him. No one sought to test him for gunshot residue, <coughs> DNA, or anything else. <coughs> All day as he waited there. They stayed there at GPD, criminal investigative sections, and waited until about 5 a.m., nearly 10 hours later, when he was placed under arrest. The police investigators at that time had already formed their own opinion about what had happened. They had already made their rush to judgment. The government has presented its theory of the case that Mark <coughs> recklessly shot him while seated in the passenger seat of the, of the truck. However, the evidence will show a different theory, that Mark was preventing Burke from committing suicide. And that this happened while Bert was partially seated in the driver's seat, and Mark was in the driver's doorway. And while no one knows why anyone <coughs> commits suicide, depression is usually a good indicator. The evidence will show that Bert was not necessarily a very happy camper. Several witnesses have come forward stating he was not happy in his marriage. He was having an affair with his co-worker for over three years, and his wife supposedly didn't know about it. Many who knew him didn't even know he was a married man because he led another life, <coughs> that of an entertainer who entertains every night in the bars and clubs. See, the FBI performed a forensic cell phone analysis of both Mark's phone and Bert's phone. It's contained in this big old hard drive that has all kinds of information. It took up the whole hard drive that we had to provide. It includes Bert's phone, of course, and it tells a lot. And it reveals a totally different person. His text messages, his WhatsApp messages, and most importantly, his Viber account provides a wealth and dearth of information showing his extramarital affairs and relations and in particular, his distress over his relationship with his then girlfriend, <coughs> Abigail Rages, and its effect on him. Bert's cell phone reveals a man who's living a double life. All day Sunday, while he was indeed fixing the plumbing, he was fighting with Abigail on his fiber account. While he was, all the while, he's working at home and his wife's out somewhere. Abigail is badgering him repeatedly all day long about the status of their relationship. Where is it going? Do you really want this? Bert's wife had caught him about a week earlier and told him to stop texting her. Clearly, Bert was caught between his emotions. His girlfriend, Abigail Rages, works with Bert at the lieutenant governor's office. And when first approached, she denied having an affair she wouldn't even let them look at her phones. That's personal. Several times, investigators tried to talk to her to at least find out the truth about their relationship. <clears throat> it was not until months later that she admitted to their affair and that she's been identified as the person named Bestie on his phone. Although several witnesses may have been not depressed, there's a very convincing claim and a very convincing case that he is very, very troubled in his relationships, to say the least. The evidence in this case will also consist of the physical evidence. And the government contends that the physical evidence supports their theory of how the gun 
made up on off. The defense has a very different view of the evidence. The blood inside the truck, all, all on the driver's side. None on the passenger's chair, not on the passenger's door, not on the passenger's dashboard, all on the driver's side, including the driver's door. Step up there. None on the seating, on the passenger side. None on either of the interior doors, the driver's door, handle, door. Passenger, no, no blood there. Someone on the left-handed shot that. Excuse me, right-handed. <coughs> blood evidence tells two different stories. Of where it occurred. Vomit. That's interesting. Why is there vomit? Found in between the driver's seat and the console area. You also heard that between the driver's seat and the console is the sunshade. You'll see pictures of that. You'll see pictures of that. Why is there vomit there? The gun was found on the driver's <coughs> side dashboard. Face that way, excuse me. <laughs> Facing that way. On the driver's side. Blood was found on the top of the dashboard. The bullets issue is correct. There's an unexpended, unused bullet on the passenger seat, right there. This is key. The bullet casing, which is the empty stand shell, is found on the driver's, between the driver's seat, excuse me, and the console on top of the sunshade. Not in the console. Towards the driver's side. There are six bullets left in the magazine, one in the injection port, one on the seat, <coughs> the one that's left in the bottom. Where those bullets were found is very important. <coughs> Officer Titanko will confirm for us what happens with this type of a gun. There's no safety on it, it's got to be pulled back and forth whether it jams, whether it pops out, how, all, how that all works, the experts will tell us. And how that gun, could, how that bullet could have gotten there, he will also be able to share with us. Fingerprints, or rather the lack thereof. Seven prints were found, but none of value. No fingerprints on the gun. We cannot tell based on fingerprints who pulled <coughs> that trigger. Gunshot residue, or again the lack thereof, because in this case the government simply refused to test a number of the items that we had asked be tested for gunshot residue. Why? Because gunshot residue can be found on a person's body or clothing to indicate the proximity of that person's hand or clothing to the firing of the gun. Of course, if the gun is about two inches away or close up, there's going to be residue here. But is there going to be residue here? Is there going to be residue on my pants if I'm, if I'm shooting like this? Again, the lack of evidence is something that you will all consider. Photos, crime scene photos. We'll see photos of the truck out there, photos inside the truck, photos from abandoned ship, photos of the autopsy. Likewise, the defense will present our own photos. 
The defense is also assisted in this case by our investigator, Agnes Blas. Uh, she will testify in this case and provide you our defense theories, uh, interviewing all the witnesses and reviewing all the FBI analysis and tell you uh, a lot of facts that are very important to the defense in this case. The videos from abandoned ships show everybody inside and outside. There's a 3D reenactment. The government's produced its own high-tech 3D thing with some accident reconstruction company. The defense, of course, will present our own low-tech GIGO photos version. So there will both be two different stories. Two very, very different stories. <coughs> Again, the physical evidence will include cell phone records and analysis. And these records, as we indicated before, are very, very tough. You just read his texts and his messages with Abigail that day. The guy's, the guy's hurt. Again, the physical evidence supports a defense theory that the shooting may have occurred while Bert was partially seated, attempting suicide. And we have our defense expert to counter Dr. Espinola. Our defense expert's name is Dr. Joseph Cohen. He is a forensic pathologist from Napa, California. He's an expert in the field of forensic pathology. He's testified on Guam several times, I believe, before. He's very qualified as he was Riverside County, California, uh, chief forensic pathologist and the medical examiner in New York City. Dr. Cohen reviewed all the reports in this case, including Dr. Espinola's report. He challenges, he disputes, and he debunks everything that Dr. Espinola has to say about this case. The physical evidence and the expert testimony will show that Mark did not recklessly, under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life, shoot and kill Bird. He did not use a gun, and there is no evidence that Mark was the one who shot Bird. The only person who may have used the gun and who had any reason to use the gun was Bert. And there's only two people there that night who know. And only one is here to tell you. Yes, Mark Torrey Jr. will waive his rights to remain silent and tell you what happened in this case. Mark will tell you he's 32 years old works as a police officer since 2010. He also works for the Guam Army National Guard since 2006. He was born and raised here, went to public schools, he went to Alfabet Duenas, then he graduated from GW in 2002. He was an all-island athlete, he went to college and played baseball in California and in Alabama, and then he returned and attended UOG. Mark will tell you he lives with his wife, Julia, his little daughter, and Jigo at the Tory family home on Chalan Andai. His grandmother lives downstairs. <coughs> he and his family lives in the middle unit, and his parents live on the top floor. His parents are Lieutenant Mark Tory and Deanne Tory, who will likely testify in this case as well. Mark is a decorated Army officer and war veteran, having served in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan in 2008 and again in 2013. He was awarded the Bronze Star Medal and Combat Infantryman Badge, numerous, numerous other commendations for his service. He joined the Army in 2006 and was eventually commissioned a first lieutenant in 2011, and he continues to serve. In 2008, on his first tour to Afghanistan, Mark was a member of the Guam unit that lost two soldiers. Brian Young Guerrero and Samson Mora. They were killed and another was seriously inju injured when an IED exploded in the Humvee that was right behind Mark. Mark and others tried to rescue them. The truck was in flames. Bullets and explosives were going off. Mark had to watch his fellow officer burn it down. Despite this, Mark went again to Afghanistan in 2013. For his service, as I indicated, he was awarded the Bronze Star Medal for leading hundreds of soldiers in hundreds of combat missions throughout Afghanistan. 
Unfortunately, Mark's service to our country has caused him to suffer from a mild form of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. He's been diagnosed by the doctors at the VA and others and continues in PTSD treatment. Mark returned from war in 2014 and continued at GPD. He advanced himself and in April 2015 became, a cert became certified in Special Weapons and Tactics, so SWAT. And yes, he was proudly featured on the front page of the PDM with his dad, both of them having completed um, SWAT training. That night, Mark experienced an alcohol-induced blackout. Mark will tell you that from the time before he left the beach bar to the time he was at Navy Hospital, while he may have a few fragmented memories or snapshots of the incident, he has no narrative memory of that time period. He will tell you what he does and does not remember. What he does remember is that he never intentionally, recklessly, or even negligently pointed a gun and shot at Bert. <coughs> he has no memory of the gun shot and going off. He does remember a concussion or a boom feeling. It's a flash. He sees blood coming out of a person. He's trying to save a friend's life. He remembers this boom occurring while he is standing in the driver's side of the truck. He next remembers holding Bird up in the driveway. He remembers someone later asking, where's your gun? He remembers riding in the ambulance. And he remembers eventually being in Navy Hospital. He does not remember leaving the beach bar. He does not remember anything at abandoned ship, despite viewing it again and again. Arriving, dancing, hanging by the bar, meeting up with the bouncers, and making these comments to Crystal Paco about how hot she is, making other comments to transgendered individuals of how they might try to do something. He does not remember any of that. He does not remember leaving. He does not remember himself on the bad body cam looking for his car in the wrong place around the building. He does not remember the video of the body cam. Although he has feelings about it, or emotions and flashes regarding what's being said. And what's being said on the body cam by Mark is the same thing he can tell you today during his trial. Mark has been diagnosed and peer treated by Dr. Pablo Stewart of San Francisco, who will serve as our expert witness on this case and explain to you what alcohol-induced blackout is. Dr. Stewart is a clinical professor at the University of California at San Francisco Department of Psychiatry School of Medicine, one of the best med schools in the country. He's been a clinical professor there for over 30-some years. He is a renowned expert. He's published over 15 books and articles and journals and he is qualified as an expert psychiatrist in over 200 cases worldwide. He will testify as to his qualifications and experience, and as to his examination, diagnosis, and treatment of Mark. He will help explain to you, in layperson's terms, why Mark has no reliable narrative memory. He will explain what an alcohol-induced backup is, the difference between a narrative memory and a fragmented memory. And yes, he will tell you that an alcohol-induced blackout is a very, very real thing. What's also important to note is what you will not hear as evidence in this case. You will not hear that Mark had any reason or motive to kill, to shoot, or to even hurt Bert. Bert was his fellow officer, fellow SWAT member. They did not have any animosity whatsoever. Whatsoever. And boy, they looked. They looked for some reason in all the cell phone messages, fighting over a girlfriend or something, fighting over the wife affair or something. No. No reason whatsoever. 
and you're getting along in the videos. That's clear. They shared no mutual girlfriends or affairs with the wives, as, as has been suggested in social media. Mark has no reason or motive whatsoever, whatsoever, to shoot or hurt him. And while you may hear that Mark carries his gun while off duty, he's never been reckless or irresponsible with his firearm. While some officers may get up there and testify, hey, GPD Red said we cannot carry our weapon and drink. I would submit to you they need to reread that regulation because that's not what it says. Of course, cops can carry their weapons while drinking. They just can't use it. They just can't use it is what the rule says. More importantly, You'll hear that perhaps it's estimated the majority of Guam Police Department officers carry while drinking, while off duty. This is not only for their protection, ladies and gentlemen, but in this day and age when people are shooting at <coughs> clubs and running over our tourists in Tumon, most police would be well served to have their weapon at hand, even if they're out socializing, and even if they're out drinking. Why? Because with Guam's concealed weapon carry law, anybody else can do it. Anybody else with a permit can carry a concealed weapon into the bar and drink to their heart's content? <coughs> and the Guam Police Department doesn't want their own officers carrying? You will hear, again, that it's estimated that more than half and the cops who will testify truthfully to that fact uh, will also appear in this case. You will not hear that Mark's crazy or reckless you will not hear that he's belligerent, causing out fights when he's out drinking. He's been described by others as a comic drunk. You'll see him dancing and goofing around. He's just not that type of monster. <coughs> Recall that I asked during jury selection if you go put aside everything you've heard, read, or seen and decide this case solely and strictly on the evidence facts that you'll hear in this case, and the laws is on instruction. <coughs> you all affirm, you all swore, I would do that. The government is expected to take three to four weeks to present all their witnesses and evidence. Then the defense will <coughs> present our case, including Mark, our investigators, our experts. That's a long time away. Until then, we ask that you keep an open mind from this day forward, until you've heard all the sides of the story. Yes, Mark Torrey is an army officer, a police officer, who was sworn to protect and to serve. He tried to do that on July 13th, when, as he said, he was just trying to help a friend. Thank you, Sidious Malasi, Salama, for your service as jurors in this case. Thank you, Mark.